So welcome everybody to the second open discussion on the Towards a Neurodevelopmentally Aware Trauma Response of Ireland. I'm really excited to have you here um, and delighted and thankful that you've given up your time to, to come along and uh, listen to the inputs, but more importantly, to contribute to what we might be able to achieve together. Um, it's absolutely fine when you're in the small groups to raise concerns about where things might go or what the dangers are of engaging in a trauma-informed way, because there are dangers with anything, really, I think. And when we're, um, when we're in power positions uh, in relation to other people, we must be mindful. So trauma uh, or a trauma-informed practice could be potentially delivered in ways that we don't want. Um, so that's important to reflect on as well. We don't want it to be a buzzword, which it could be. Um, so really, it, it's fine to say anything to express any concerns that you have, because we want to learn and we, we want to, I suppose, if we're going to propose things, we want them to be acceptable. And particularly from my perspective, they have to be um, not only acceptable, but um, empowering for survivors I think that's extremely important um, and I'm sure many of you will agree with me so I'm not going to rattle on anymore I'm just going to introduce you to Maria Woodwire from Penn the Prevention and Early Intervention Network and Maria is going to talk a little bit about early years and why trauma and prevention and early intervention are quite intertwined so Maria welcome thank you so much for taking the time Thanks very much, Jane. Hi, folks. I'm delighted to be here. I think it's a fabulous format. I watched last week and just thought that's the way we should do things, kind of informed, but yet informal conversations that you leave thinking much broader than when you first came. So thanks very much to the speakers from last week. And I hope that I can add something and look forward to learning more today as well. Um, so as Jane said, my name is Maria O'Dwyer. I'm the National Coordinator of the Prevention and Early Intervention Network. So it's a membership organization that looks at supporting, uh, focusing on prevention and early intervention with child and family services. And for us in that type of work, trauma would be up front and center in terms of, if we're talking about prevention and early intervention, we can't not talk and recognize the importance of, of bringing trauma into that discourse. Um, myself as well, in terms of my own background, I'm a sociologist and a researcher. Um, so I'm absolutely fascinated by the interplay between structures um, in society and people. And I, I find it particularly fascinating how we separate those out. So if we talk about trauma in the case of abuse, for example, and we talk about institutional abuse and clerical abuse and the establishment, we very much separate that into a structure and another versus the people who actually experience it. Um, as victims of it and I find that from a sociological perspective absolutely fascinating. In terms of the piece I wanted to kind of just talk about for the next few minutes really it's looking at prevention and early intervention in terms of those early years so really pre-birth to the six years which is the the, the focus um, of a lot of prevention early intervention work and I always say that with the preface sometimes when we say that when we're talking to parents parents get quite spooked about the fact that at six does the magic window close and it's like absolutely not we're looking at like life life outcomes over the the life course but just looking at if we can front load those supports and stop things happening because when we're talking about prevention we're talking about putting in that protective layer from the get-go to stop something happening in the first place and then early intervention that if it does happen can we put in the right supports quick enough to try and mitigate um, to slow the horse down really I, I suppose and I was thinking this, this afternoon before I logged on there was two examples so my previous role would have been I managed one of the area-based childhood programmes in Limerick um, for, for seven or eight years. And in that, we were dealing, I suppose, with families who really were experiencing adversity and adverse childhood experiences and ACEs were very much tied in to the type of work that we were trying to do in terms of addressing child poverty. And two things jumped out for me in, in, in terms of, of trauma, really. And number one was a meeting that we were scheduled to have. So all 12 of the area-based sites were supposed to go to Dublin. We did go to Dublin to meet with the then minister at the time for children, um, uh, Catherine Zapone. And the idea was that we were really looking at you know, ACEs were, were front and centre in terms of national discourse. Two years ago, it was really right. In terms of early years, how are we getting in early enough? Going to meet Catherine Zapone um, about that and how we could extend that learning beyond the 12 sites where the area-based projects were to, to a national level. How would we incorporate all of this learning and share it out? And at the very last minute, as we were seated in the meeting room in Dublin, Catherine Zapone and the Secretary General had to cancel because they were called to a meeting 
at emergency meeting about the mother and baby homes. And to me, that was a real stark thing about trauma that, you know, obviously the resources had to be given to dealing with this huge retrospective trauma and the fallout from it. I mean, the events were retrospective, but the fallout would be long and will be long felt. But here was also a group of 12 people who were of what's already happened. But how do we allocate equal resources and attention to stop it happening in the first place? And for us, that's been a really important part of the work that we're doing. I said I had two examples. That was kind of the policy level of, you know, um, we couldn't look at something. A practice level as well, in that same role, I remember we were involved in um, uh, dealing with moms, uh, expectant parents. So the idea being that parents who had experienced trauma themselves who are about to become parents, how do we manage this? That we recognize their own trauma, but how do we stop the replication of it? And how do we hit this intergenerational cycle that we're always chasing and the, the kind of magic place where we want to stop it all happening? Um, and there was a mom who presented, she had been referred in, and medically, and the clinicians were delighted because she was considered clean, you know, that the substance abuse and the, the drug addiction had stopped had been paused. And so the, the, this idea that the body was clean, that physically she was ready to be a parent, and that was almost equated to she's ready to be a parent. When you ask the question, have we dealt with what, what led to the addiction in the first place or the substance abuse and what kind of trauma did she experience? And so our focus is that she births a healthy, a physically healthy baby, but have we lost focus on her, her trauma? And that's that's one of the preventive pieces as well. How do we stop it happening to the baby that's about to be born, but also recognising that she's a person in her own right. It's not just about um, the next generation. And as a result, we managed to, to work um, in collaboration with services in Limerick for the allocation of a perinatal um, mental health service that had a psychiatrist attached to it. And that was a huge recognition, I think, at a time while we're actually taking trauma seriously now pre-birth and we're trying to get in there and stop it. So I think nationally, in terms of prevention, early intervention and trauma, we're bringing the conversation closer together um, but it kind of leads on to the second point that I wanted to, to talk about really which was how we should be we should be how pre the prevention of ACEs should be a major public social and health priority and it can only be that if all of the departments are talking together so we don't have this kind of dichotomy of health will deal with this side of it and then the department of children will deal with this side and we separate it out really nicely except for the person who's experienced trauma or the person who's at risk of trauma how do they get to all those separate places and how is it connected so i always think you know it's like everything we work backwards so instead of working at the top and filtering down we're kind of arguing from underneath and the bottom through something down this way it's almost waiting for the scraps to come and, and that's always a precarious position when we talk about trauma in in the current context i think what's really interesting as well is what we see a lot in prevention early intervention work is people have an idea that for something to constitute trauma it's massive that it's absolutely huge and it has been life shattering um, and all types of trauma are but the problem there then and the issue with that kind of definition or lens is it's tied in always with the big life altering events that may happen um, and, 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 and pause things at a certain point in time. And we would often explain to parents that, you know, poverty, the criminality that they're living or that, that, that's in their local area, all of those things constitute um, adverse childhood experiences or potential. And people are amazed to hear that, you know, and it's how you how you explain that and how you work with parents with the prevention early intervention lens without ever scaring them. The fact that, oh, yeah, where you're living is going to mean X, Y and Z for your child. You know, this idea, show me the child at three and I'll describe the man at 23. But actually, let's put those safeguards in um, in terms of recognising trauma. And I think if you take today as an example, right, so if you think about collective trauma and the national psyche, and I think this is fascinating, that in, in the north of Ireland in the Troubles, you would have had that collective trauma. In Ireland, it would have been the famine in 1845 when we had that. But actually, COVID is the same. I mean, different contexts. But if you think about nationally, the focus on death, on survival, like a generation of children that think contact with their grandparents might kill their, their grandparents, that's a very abnormal place to be. And there will be you know, significant conversations and preventive elements that have to be put in. And there's some of it that has caused massive trauma and will continue to do already. So in terms of the prevention early intervention piece, it's now working with services around, we're, we're currently developing a paper on that. How do we work with families in the shadow of a pandemic address and acknowledge what's happened and kind of look at where that's going to plot going forward for them in terms of the trauma that they carry, that they've experienced, or the fear that they still live in, which is traumatic in itself. 
So from the prevention and early intervention perspective, we're always then looking at how, like how do we really flag the, the, the need for trauma-informed approaches in prevention and early intervention. And another misperception, and it, it, it's a widely cited one, we hear it quite a lot, is that, you know, in the early years, there's so many nice touchy-feely points where you can stop that. So people think, you know, early year services, which do incredible jobs um, at providing the protective layer. But in a lot of the community-based services, a lot of the practitioners themselves have experienced trauma and carry. So when we're saying that, you know, this idea, we have these neat boxes that we hand children into that parents can provide this role if they can't there's an additional protective here with early years or schools but in, instead we need to actually recognize how do we make all of those services trauma informed themselves so that's the safe landing spot for them and you'd find when you talk to a lot of services they will tell you you're tra they're trauma informed and when you try to unpack that a little, sometimes it's just being able to define trauma um, or what their idea of trauma or lots of statistics on ACEs. And to be fair, a very thorough understanding of ACEs, but how that translates into practice then can often be very, very different. So for us, it's always looking at, and you know, I, I think it's so funny as a researcher that research has become such an almost dirty word that when, like we've researched things to death. And I would always argue, but the research and then the issues will always be like, um, companions on the journey as well they should be and if we're looking at research I, I think Trevor Spratt made a really good point with the kind of ACEs footprint and, and the idea that we don't need to go off and reinvent things we know that in Ireland there's significant trauma and we're seeing more and more of it but it's to actually be able to determine the extent and the, the breadth of it and we don't have to reinvent the wheel we can tag that kind of data mapping onto things that exist already like we have the going up in Ireland study we have the area-based childhood programs who are always um, gathering and depositing data nationally. So we should be able to draw on multiple sources to be able to really both quantitatively and qualitatively talk about trauma in a very informed way. And I think when we can do that, it's recognising and making people understand through really effective communication that trauma is everybody's business. So, I, I, you know, when you work with children and you work in prevention and early intervention, the, the understanding is, well, you're, you're answerable to one department and that's the Department of Children equality and then the five other things that we have attached on but no it's that it's health like when you talk about slauncher care and we're talking about first five and and, and all of those things you want to talk to um to department of justice and you can't do any of that without talking to finance because they're holding the purse strings so how we've never taken that whole of government approach now signs are good i mean the first five strategy in ireland for the early years is the first time ever we've taken a whole of government approach to something and it would be really for us um, in terms of prevention and early intervention is to drive that message that let's look at it across departments, let's look at it holistically and let's stop reacting, stop spending money on inquiries, tribunals, all of the things afterwards and let's actually get in early enough um, that we can manage both, both the fallout and the, the, the hopeful prevention of issues from, from growing in the first place. The other piece is looking at the kind of intergenerational conversations that we need to have. Very conscious, especially in the early years, and I also find this really interesting in terms of who's caring for small children and the kind of different messages that they're hearing. And, you know, massive influence um, of earlier services of the family. And we're seeing now, which is actually lovely, the return of grandparenting, especially post-COVID as kind of as childcare. But a lot of the work was at the area-based childhood programmes there was a lot of responses from grandparents around this has all gone very overprotective and they're all so cosseted and protected that you can't even have a conversation now and you know so children were getting very mixed messages about what they could say how they could discuss things parents were so it's that intergenerational piece that if we're having conversations about trauma are we having them in a way that like as I said earlier it's everybody's business and we can make it accessible across the generation across the ages and across the kind of socio-demographic divides that have traditionally existed and how we present and disseminate information. Sorry, Jane, just keep an eye on my time. Um, and and uh, the last thing I suppose I want to say, there's loads I want to say, and I look forward to it in the groups, but the other part for us in, 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 in the work that we do in, in prevention and early intervention is about giving parents and children a voice in what the services that are trauma-informed should look like. I think a lot of parents are probably starting to understand 
the trauma informed as a concept that they see as something again that's done to them as part of a service or something that's offered rather than something that they should actually help to guide and inform what are they comfortable with what are they happy with um, and we've done a lot of that work with small children in services where little ones will tell you quite often you know I'm, I'm, I'm always talking about my feelings I'm kind of tired of talking about my feelings and it's really interesting to hear those things and how we bring that voice into the work that we do in terms of making um, trauma-informed approaches and trauma-informed culture part of prevention and early intervention work. So that's me. Um, I look forward to the next part of the conversation and to taking any questions later as well. Thanks, folks. Maria, thank you so much. Um, that was uh, brilliant. And I especially love um, your emphasis on the fact that it, it is everybody's business and the listening to whoever is accessing the services, be it children or their parents, and, and yeah, not ramming um, our agenda down their throats at inconvenient times. That came up the last time too. You know, we're not always in a position to talk about our emotions. You actually have to feel safe. Sometimes the last thing, I've been that place myself recently, I did not want to talk about my own feelings or I wasn't in the space to do so. So, um, many, many thought provoking things there and the, the fact that um, the overprotective nature is also very interesting in the role of grandparents, you know, the freedoms that children once had when we were growing up versus the COVID generation who couldn't even go outside uh, for a very long time. So um, it, much food for thought, Maria. Thank you so much. And I believe that Don O'Leary and Rachel, I see Rachel Lucy here now as well. Thanks so much for joining, guys. You're going to talk a little bit about education and um, the, the kind of heart centered approach that you deliver in the Cork Life Centre and maybe, you know, whatever other reflections that you have. So I don't know who'd like to go first, um, Rachel or Don. Why don't you just decide okay we'll, we'll call on Don maybe first yeah. hi Don uh, welcome thank you thanks for inviting us Jane um I suppose you know I mean one of the things I'm going to say now kind of maybe strike people as as what are you doing here but we run a service that looks at the young person as a whole um, we don't always and probably never use the word trauma um and there, there is a reason for that um, I think for me, how we started here and the model we work under uh, has led us to this situation whereby we're dealing with oh, in the community, not a school. Uh, we're not a school. The kids will tell you you're not a school. We're an education centre. And, and for me, um, very early on here, um, young people coming to the centre will have been removed from schools or have been in our mental health services, our addiction services, or, or some other service. Um, and, and when they get here, they're very wary of adults. Um, they don't trust. Children in care would be one that they find it really, really difficult. And, you know, we're talking about uh, intergenerational and, and, and other traumas. And traumas, you know, I, I, I'd said, you know, sometimes it can be a pet um, that, that breaks the, causes that person, young person to spiral. Um, they don't believe that adults care about them. That might be what they've learned. You know, if you think about a child being put into care, there's a letdown by the parents. The child then walks out there in care because they want to go back to their families because each child will want to protect their family system. No matter what the professionals think, that's what they're going to do. They always do that. And so they fight to get out of, out of care and get back home. They're then moved from care. So new adults again. Someone else has left them though. They end up in Oberstown or the justice system and they're treated for all their trauma is going to be treated in Oberstown because we have a broken health system, we have a broken addiction system, we have a broken education system. So when young people come in here, what we have to do, the first thing we have to do is to build a relationship. No young person is going to leave you into any part of their life unless you build that, particularly 
as they already feel they failed. Um, that sometimes can take a month. It can sometimes take five years. But I think sticking with the young person, you know, initially they will fight against it, push you away, push you away. Because if you put yourself in that child's position, they've been let down by adults. So why would you bother building a relationship with an adult when they're going to disappear? So it's about staying there in, in, all the, in all the noise and listening to the child. And when the child is ready to tell you stuff, they will tell you. And then it's about us as a team being able to put in supports around that. It'll be able to speak to the parents and put in supports around that. It might be their care team and try to get supports around that. And I think for me, um, our whole being here is about not the labels that we give to children willy-nilly. There is not one label that I've ever seen on a child's head that tells you anything about a child or that is anything positive about a child. But okay, what it is? Uh, autism, uh, that means you're excluded and you're put into an autism class. Behaviour, you go to a behavioural class. If you're in care, where do you go then? You have all these other issues. If you're in addiction, where do you go to? And my thing is, we're dealing with children. We deal with the child, the child has issues. We love the child, we need to change the issues. Behaviour patterns, whatever it may be. And I, I find that, you know, we have very little support from the state. And I sometimes get worried about people talking about trauma because for me, either the whole team is involved from the start or you're not informed. And every one of us has to be informed and every one of us has to be able to take in and look and see in the morning a child coming in the door and have some understanding of why that child is very sullen, why that child may be very quiet, why that child may be tearful. And I think until, until we do that, and until everyone does that, then you can't be torn on farm. I, I mean, the, the other issue for me as well, and it's, it's, it's something that's becoming a big bugbear for me, is that there is a massive difference between a guidance counsellor and counsellor therapy. They're not the same. They are not the same. And, and for me, you know, we have four counsellors within our centre, counsellor therapists. We do have a, a guidance counsellor and we also have a drugs counsellor. And for me, we don't force children into that. They, they, they will decide themselves. Over time, they will decide. Um, I love the way courts decide that a child needs, or the guards decide that a child needs um, the smoking weed and they have a problem and they don't need to go into residential care. Brilliant. If Tell me which adult who has an alcohol problem when friends go and say you need help and they don't believe they need help will do anything about it. Children are the same. It, 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 you, you must build the strengths of the child. And the child will then come to you and say, I have an issue, and then you work. And the, the, the problem for me, I think, I, I agree totally with, with what I said prior to me coming on, that our services are not interlinked. Uh, you know, CAMS, I, I'm dreading the end of, of, of COVID because CAMS, we're going to get a tsunami of, of children with mental health issues. And, and you know, sometimes people say, oh, they're not re re resilient enough. Children, for the first time ever, have probably been in the home 24 hours a day, not all, but some, with domestic violence all day long. Um, something they may have heard at night in the past, but now they see it all day long. We have kids who have been abused um, with no help in sight. Um, unfortunately for schools and teachers want to support children, whether they like it or not, or education judges success on exam results. Not on having not on having a child alive, but a child being able to go out and live in the world that's out there. That's for us is the most important thing. And I think I'm go I, I'm gonna hand over to Rachel and but before I do I would say um I, I had a child here, he's just gone in probably the latest he, he came from England, a former pupil came from England and he came to see me. Uh, and we sat here and we talked um, 
And, and to hear that child explain what he thought this centre was about for me was, was everything. Um, and, you know, we have 55 kids in the centre, but we just have 55 kids. We have 55 families. We have communities that are involved here because when something is off kilter, then it's off kilter for the whole family, not just the child, child we're dealing with. Um, we do need our, our, our government to start recognising the fact that children's services should be uh, combined. They should not be um, waiting for NEPS to go into a school and pick two of the kids in school who the, who the staff think need NEPS. That's not how it works, you know. Um, I sometimes feel in schools, I'm not blaming schools, it's how, it's how they're set up. Uh, five children running up and down the walls, five children fading into the walls, acting in and acting out. The ones most likely to be sent to camps are the acting out kids. When the, the kids most in danger at that particular time are the kids that are acting in. They're so terrified that they're sitting there, can't take part and just disappear. Um, and, and I suppose, you know, when, when, when you look at it, if you look, look at uh, the mental health beds for, 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 for children in Cork. What is it? Six in, in, um, in, in, in Besborough. Um, children are supposed to be children since they're 18 here. However, if you're not inside in um, CAMS, at 17, you're put into an adult mental health service. You're put into the adult mental health ward. And we have that all over in, in relation to um, money. And the money is there. And I'll tell you how I know the money is there. If we send one child to Oversaw, it's two, between 250,000 and 350,000 per year, per year, for that child to be there. Now, so society has to take a step here as well. Um, stop sending children because of broken services into this juvenile justice system. It's happening all the time. I was on the board of Oversaw. I don't agree that children should be in detention anyway, um, because if there's children in detention, there's something going wrong. What's gone wrong? It isn't it, it isn't a bad child. It is something has gone wrong. And we don't look at that. We don't want to look at that. And, and it's, it would be cheaper to look at that than to send that child to over some. Uh, unfortunately, we don't do that. I'm sorry, no, that might be fragmented, but if Rachel, I don't know where she's gone, Tommy, uh, Rachel will probably come in. <laughs> I'm here. I'm, 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 and no, thank worries. You, Rachel. no worries. I'm just going to speak really briefly because you got stuck with a double act of the two of us, and I'm sure there's other people to speak. Um, and we had no particular plan about who would say what. I suppose just for the, the sake of my tiny talking worth about what I've learned, I suppose, about working with young people who've experienced a lot of trauma over the last 12 years, which I've been, been lucky to do, is exactly as Maria was saying and Don alluded to again, it's about a relationship. So relationships isn't something that happens to you. It's not like an intervention happens to you. You're, you're part of building it. I suppose Don mentioned a young man who visited us today. We're really lucky. We get an awful lot of opportunities to reflect on those relationships we've built as well because our students come back and see us. Um, and I was able to say to that young man today with complete authenticity, because that is my advice, be authentic and be honest in your relationships. There are obviously boundaries to the relationships that you have with children and young people, but I always try to be as honest and authentic as I can, because this relationship isn't something that's happening to them. It's something that we're building together, but it's great to be able to tell young people, and I was able to honestly say to that person today, you taught me more about how to work with young people than most anyone that I've ever met, because the journey was so challenging. Um, and that kind of authenticity, one of the biggest things I've learned is really important is to be prepared to learn how to figure it out with the young person. Again, Maria said there, sometimes people don't want to talk about their feelings. Don't be making me do things that I'm not ready to do. Um, so a, a lot of it for me is about, for some of it seems quite inactive. Some of the best work maybe that I've done a week for people is just waiting, just staying and waiting. People aren't used to having people who are willing to actually wait until they're ready. And then in, in the relationship with authentic, we're not perfect. You know, words matter, the language we use with young people matter, all the conversations matter. Because I firmly believe, you know, that, that it's that kind of gem that every interaction is an intervention. But if you feel like you get it wrong or you've misunderstood or you've tried to help someone regulate in a way that didn't help, just apologize, just say that really didn't work, you know, I'm sorry, it obviously didn't work for you. 
but you have to build it together. You have to say to young people, what is the best thing that helps? This, this isn't helping. This is, and that kind of staying and waiting piece has been my biggest learning point. As Dan said, sometimes people come and you're like, why do you trust me so quickly? And it builds up. And sometimes it is literally five years of feeling this young person doesn't want to open, doesn't want to talk, and you you just you just literally wait, and you're consistent, um, and and you don't you don't go anywhere. And I had another former student visit today, and it really brought home to me the importance of that kind of every interaction is an intervention piece. So we're all there when we're busy, and of course we're very you're mindful of of how important all your interactions with young people are and the language that you use. But a young man who's been out of our service for two years since he didn't watch him into the East today and he said to me, Rachel, I remember something you said to me there a few years ago when I was in sixth year and I had no idea what you were going to say. And you said at the time that I was going like this, I couldn't remember. I said, I don't remember saying that what you said. And he said, you were saying that I was going up and up and up and the things were because he was, he was just coming into his own, he was blossoming. And he said to me, you know, I've been thinking about that lately. He said, You're right. He said it was an amazing time in my life and I was going up and up and up. And then he said COVID came. And I went down and down and down and down and down. But he said, you know what, Rachel, I'm coming back up again. And it was it was so lovely. Do not, that young person was able to identify. People really remember what we say to them. Um, and it, it does matter what we say to them. And you don't, sometimes you feel just lost in all of it. You know, as Don is describing there, the systems, and it's all a mess, and how can we fix it? But, you know, you would be surprised at, something you said not even giving it at the right time in the right place um the impact that it had and, and the seeds that it sowed so that's just my few thoughts not to take up too much of your time thank you both so much don and rachel i i i love the work that you do um and the team um it was it was a pleasure getting to know you a little bit a few years ago and meet some of the young people and hear them on the Oireachtas, you know, giving testimony um, to the power of relationships. And I think that for me, as you both beautifully um, described there, you know, it's hard not to be emotional at the, at the thought of what young people are facing and how so many professionals, no matter how well-meaning they are, don't always have that patience to sit and stay and wait, wait the five years. And our systems aren't really designed to allow that kind of time. So um, thank you both so much. And especially thank you, Don, for taking the time to, to, to come um, to, to share. And hopefully you can stay for a bit of the discussion as well afterwards, because we just have one more um, brilliant person to speak now. And Hayden is going to give us some reflections from the community perspective. So welcome, Anne. Everyone, sorry, if everyone could just be sure that you're muted, that would be great, other than Anne. Thanks a lot. Hi, everybody. I'm, um, I'm not working in any sector. Um, I'm somebody who, well, I volunteer with the Kayla, and it was through the Kayla that I came across the ASA study. And I remember, actually, Jane, it was you who gave a talk that day on ACES and I remember thinking oh my god why does everybody not know about this you know because it just made so much sense and so after that I was just so interested in in finding out more and then I started to listen to Gabo Mate on addiction and all because I live in a community that's deeply traumatized. Um, we have a high level of crime, unemployment, um, drug addiction, and uh, a high level of violence, really. Um, and we had a, um, a couple of suicides, young men taking their own lives over the past couple of years. So I was thinking, like, 
we we've in this in our community this has been going on for years like so i can go back to the 80s when i moved in here first and we had um heroin problems in the area and there was young men dying back then and families were just distraught and and over the years, they've put money into this, that and the other, and they've tried to help, you know, do things to, to help. And then the community gets this um, name. I've heard it said, you know, by people who work in the community. Oh, sure. You know, you, you just keep, you can put all the money you like into it. It, it won't make a difference. You know, there are all sorts of names called. But then I was thinking, well, if, 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 if it's not working, then obviously let's see, you know, why it's not working. <laughs> it has to go deeper than that. And through the knowledge of the ACE study on trauma, I began to see that this, you know, this is what the problem is. There are so many people who are individually traumatized coming from intergenerational back from those families in the 80s like say they were grandparents back then now their their grandchildren are coming up with with um addiction problems um i see so many women women like nearly just a small bit younger than myself who are out looking for drugs. So, yeah, so I was just thinking, well, it, it's trauma. It's absolutely trauma. It's trauma on the individual level, and then it's trauma in on the, the community level. Um, and it makes it hard for creating change in the community because there's a lack of self or a lack of uh, social cohesion. People don't want to come together. Um, there's because of the, there was recent murders there a year and a half ago, um, or just, sorry, just before COVID, of a young man who was, his body was dismembered and left all around the area. And that caused huge trauma in the community. Uh, people, People didn't want to come out. They were afraid. Um, and then we have the young lads. You can see young kids being groomed by dealers, um, going around on bicycles. And um, they're getting into this because, I would say, because they feel they've nothing else in life. Um, there's poverty in the area. So all these things bring up this um you know community level it's it's in this psyche at the community level like it's like the community don't feel good enough um so we, there's a stigma around our community so yeah i and just as an example i think young young people i just think they're given a, a raw deal here you know people call them all sorts of names and but I was, I was going into the community centre there one day and one of the young lads, because they usually gather in little gangs there, and one of them went for the handle of the door while I went for the handle of the door. And he, he went into that fight mode because he was expecting me to, you know, give out or whatever. And I said to him, Oh, I'm sorry, sorry about that. And he, his, his whole demeanor changed, and he held the door open for me, and he was so nice. Like, so I just, I just thought to myself, if if you can just change the way you speak to these young lads, rather than, you know, going down, calling them names, and it it would it would make make such a big difference. And then I just think in the schools, I have spoken in the schools with some of the teachers um, and they're really keen to learn about the ACES study and how to, how to, you know, deal with children who are coming in very traumatized and who are acting out and don't want to learn. Some of them probably because they've just come from some sort of trauma in the house or 
they may be hungry or whatever, they may not have eaten. So there is definitely um, from the schools, they do want to, they do want to learn, but I think again, all the all the uh, organizations must come together. And I just found when I started to talk about trauma over there in the community uh, center, I was like, nobody wants to hear it. You know, it was like, it was just being brushed under the carpet. It was like, oh no, nobody wants to speak about it. Then you're afraid, you know, I would love to see workshops in the community on the ACE study on trauma where the people in the who are living through these things are are educated in what's going because they they probably think there's something wrong with them as we know nothing wrong with you something happened to you but I think they would benefit definitely we would all benefit from workshops that are informing. I it benefited me even from just knowing about my own personal life. Um, people close to me that are in addiction, I was able to understand it better. Um, so I think it would be of a huge benefit for the community to have workshops to show the film uh, resilience and the wisdom of trauma film that I watched with Gabor Mate, I think would be amazing to show in a community like ours, definitely. But at the moment, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on at the moment to try and bring the community together and, you know, do things like we've been just granted um, funding for a three year creative project. And that's brilliant. That's absolutely brilliant. But we need to be able to sustain all that. And so that when that project is over and all those people have moved out that are doing it, that that still works and everybody is still together. But doing this without, I think, without getting to the deep root of what's going on, um, I just think it'll be come in, do a project, let's work with these people, go off, and then they come back and say, oh, that didn't work. Oh, should we put, you know, money into that and it didn't work. Um, and I think all, like, people, even just people from the council, count, you know, Dublin City Council, um, every, in every organisation over there needs to be trauma-informed, I think, absolutely, because I've heard name calling by people, professionals, like, and I just thought, you know, well, no, nothing's ever going to change. Nothing's ever going to change if 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 they don't change their attitude towards the people in the community. And the people in the community then just carry, because they've, the confidence of the community is really low on a, a, as a whole. So, yeah, so that's that's my bit anyway. I just think there's room for bringing in that knowledge into the community. I know some people say, oh, it might be triggering for people or, but I don't know. I think people would like to know, <laughs> you know, and it would give them, it would give them something to work on, you know rather than just that whole thing of, oh, there's something wrong with me and there's something wrong with the people in this community and they'll never change. So I just think, yeah, there's room for, for, um, for educating people, definitely. And I think we need to have a little bit more trust in people that, you know, that they would, they would take it on board. So that's my bit anyway. I'm, and on the community that I live in. Thank you so much, Anne. Um, I'm a great admirer of the work that you're doing, Anne. And um, I think actually your comments follow on really nicely from Rachel and Don's about the power of language and how we actually engage with people. And for me, uh, I, I was speaking to Caroline earlier and just mentioned, you know, um, 
the importance of relational repair, which Rachel spoke about when we get things wrong, which we do, regardless mm. of, you know, if you do 20 years of trauma training or other any other kind of training, no one's perfect. People get stressed, people get distressed, people get angry and disappointed. So the modeling relational repair and modeling apologies is, is so important and, and being careful and reflective in how we engage with people. Um, but very interesting to get your perspective on what might be triggering for the community. And like you, I believe, knowledge, this, this great power in just better understanding Absolutely. yourself and your family. So thank you so much. Um, uh, 